I'm a 3D artist. I work as a freelancer from this uh, tiny little village from Slovenia. And I still manage to work with companies, agencies, studios, other freelancers from all over the world. And I do all kinds of work. So I'm going to go ahead first. I'm going to show you what kind of stuff I do. And after that, we're going to dive into some hopefully interesting stuff. All right, here we go. Oh, thank you. Oh, so. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, some of the stuff I do. So uh, when you look at my stuff, my portfolio, my images, it seems like I'm architectural visualizer, and that's like what I focus the most. But in in reality, uh, I do all kinds of projects. I um, just for some reason I like to show more architectural stuff. So I do all kinds of work. I do um, product renders, uh, visualizations, animations, product animations, placing realistic uh, products into realistic environments, all kinds of stuff. I work closely with uh, studio uh, Humdinger & Sons from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm a 3D director there. And it's a really cool team, a creative team. And I really enjoy working with them. And we've done quite a few projects already with some pretty uh, amazing clients, so really cool projects. Uh, so, um, but what I want to talk about today is more of a personal stuff, personal projects that I do. Yesterday, my good friend Sava Zhivkovic talked about this already. It's pretty amazing. Uh, and he stressed the importance of the personal projects. And I, I just want to continue that thing because this is something I've been doing all the, from, from the start. So I realized that. Uh, for me, the best way to learn is to just start doing something, and along the way, I learn the tools, right? So if you just learn some tool, you know how it works. I seem to forget after like a couple of days. But when I have a project and I need to implement this tool into my project, then it's, uh, for me, it just stays in my head. So I've been doing this all the time from the start, and I'm still doing the same thing. So it's uh, uh, absolutely important for the, for the development. Also, the, you know, you can learn from client work, right? You have some complicated project, you learn from it. But you know, having the absolute creative freedom to do whatever you want is, for me, is really very important. So not only do I learn a lot, but also I have material for my portfolio so I can you know, get work thanks to, thanks to my personal projects. And uh, you know, it's like I work on a client project, right? And it's, maybe it's an interesting project, but it, you know, it can get a little repetitive. So after a while, I get tired, and my motivation falls down, right? I'm not really motivated anymore. So I take a break, and instead of going out for a walk or whatever, I just open up my project, my personal project. I start working on it for like an hour, right? And suddenly, my motivation is back. I'm really hyped to be working in 3D again. I remind myself, why am I doing this? I'm actually doing what I love doing every day. But you know, client jobs, sometimes you make you forget this. So doing like an hour every day, it doesn't seem like it's much. But over, like in the course of a year, there's like a couple of, like a bunch of projects that I'm working on all the time. So it's, it's always, you know, no matter what you do, no matter what, which industry you're in, you just have to do personal projects. It just, I, I can't imagine not doing them. And it's, I always have like a three or four in the making. So I keep myself excited. You know, 
work on one and kind of don't know where to go from there, jump to another one, jump to the third one, and you can keep skipping between them and keep myself focused in it. And these, these personal projects brought me many awards and publications in popular magazines like 3D Artists, Digital Production. So, you know, it's, it's really good for promotion. Recently, I was part of the book called Great Talks About Photorealism. Really excited about this, being next to these amazing artists. Uh, still not sure how I even got in there, but again, my personal projects in there. So, I really, um, really stress this thing. This, like, like, once you start, first you like you're gonna go. I don't have time for personal projects and stuff like that. But you know, when you start, you get excited about something. You'll see it's really, it's really worth it. I mean, and it's, uh, it doesn't really matter at what stage you're at. You know, if you're just starting out in 3D or whatever, it doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter where you're from. Absolutely doesn't matter. I'm going to quickly tell you a little story. So, you can, so I prove you that uh, anything is pretty much possible. So, this guy right here is me a long time ago. And I was always with computers, doing something with computers, right? And not, you know, I just want to learn something new, figure something new out, play around with stuff. And many years later, nothing has changed. I still mess around with stuff, I still learn new stuff. And miraculously, I have not aged one bit. Look at that. It's amazing. Okay, so I tried to figure out what I want to do. I didn't. So I just finished economics, got a de degree in economics for some ridiculous reason. Ended up in an accounting section in a company. And uh, I just said, okay, that's not it. I'm working with computers, but that's not freaking it. In my free time, I was uh, exploring stuff like fireworks, Photoshop. So I decided to quit that job, and I said, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna pursue my creative career. And that was uh, a really cool plan, but it didn't really work out that well. I uh, needed quite some time to find some job, uh, computer graphics related. So how I got into uh, computer graphics is actually through music. So me and my friends are playing in bands for over 20 years, right? Happy, upbeat, holiday, Christmas songs, you know. Um, yeah, that's us. We don't play that kind of music. We play death metal, but anyway. So our guitar player, he told us, uh, he told me he worked at a TV station. So uh, I asked him, can you get me in? And he said, maybe I can get you in, maybe not. So somehow he got me that job. I'm talking about, about the guy uh, wearing black. Uh, so finally got a CG related job. And um, I was working in After Effects, doing 2D animations, uh, broadcast stuff, and every time I would do something, it was just, I would rotate everything in 3D. Like, every, every time, I just those letters, I would just rotate them, push them around. So I said, okay, I need to do something with 3D related, so I used some plugins like 3D Invigorator. Realized that's not it, so I switched to, decided, you know, I have to try 3D. The first one I tried was 3ds Max. And this was at the time when there was no YouTube, there was no YouTube, no tutorials, so a lot of, uh, you know, reading uh, documentary, doc documentations and books and trying to figure things out on my own and was really slow and painful. But I saw the power of 3D. I saw what you can do with 3D, so I kept pushing forward, right? And uh, so I learned how to use it in the broadcast environment, but I was slow. I was very slow. It was just, you know, it was simple title sequences simple animations, some opening titles, stuff like that. And it's just to produce something and render it out in the high-speed environment. I was just not able to, to be as fast as I wanted to be, so I started exploring uh, options on the market, and I came across this. So I've heard of Cinema 4D, but it said broadcast. There was a broadcast version. So I said, okay, broadcast, that's what I'm doing. So I looked it up, and then I saw something that Cinema 4D is very popular about. It's uh, broadcast, uh, it's MoGraph cloner or MoGraph module. So when I saw that, it really uh, changed a lot. So all the stuff I could do with almost no keyframes, just messing around with stuff uh, very easily, uh, it really, I was hooked immediately. So I started using Cinema 4D and I was able to produce a lot more content like much quicker. It just, it just, the, the software spoke to me better. Everything was in, in the right place, right? So 
It's, it's, a, it's a personal preference, I guess, but for me, it just worked much better. And um, I was able to explore more. I wasn't focused on the technical stuff. I was more focused on the creative things I was doing. Like you're in a, in a mood, you know, like you have an idea, and you start pushing forward, and then you get to a tool, and you, have, you don't know how to use it, and you get stuck, and you start tweaking it, right? And then you lose this drive. So that, that, that's, that's the part I didn't like. And in cinema, every, every tool seems to be very easy to use. So I'm more focused on the creative stuff. So I kept, kept getting a, a lot of more work done and get, uh, creating ideas on the fly, like throwing things together and coming to, uh, coming to uh, new ideas. So, okay, I found my tools, so I said, okay, I wanna, I wanna you know, get into the community, get uh, more, um, more, you know, find, find more people to do the same things. So I was on the forums, and this is something that really changed a lot of things for me. I went to this forum, and there was this contest called 99 Frames. So the only rule was to create a three seconds long animation. Uh, you can do whatever you want. So this is what I did. Yeah. And that little piece of uh, weird animation got me a third place. And there were artists competing from all over the world. So I was, uh, I was like, I couldn't believe that happened. But also, something clicked in my mind. I said, OK, maybe I'm onto something here. Maybe I have a chance in this business, in this industry. Because so far, I was just thinking about maybe I can find a job that I actually like and you know, work there. But you know, to actually start making something that I really love and, and I really enjoy doing for money was like, OK. Let's try this. So I quit the job at the TV, found this uh, studio I worked at for a couple of years. And, something, and the important thing that happened there was I learned a lot, of, uh, a lot about working with clients, about communication. Uh, so after a couple of years, I was ready to do what I was thinking about doing for quite a while. And that's freelancing. I'm doing this for like six years now. And I really enjoy it. Uh, and I, uh, all the projects. I've been doing. It's kind of one thing that always was in the back of my mind that I really always, when I was scrolling online looking for other people's portfolios, portfolios, was when I was really excited when I could see that you can replicate real life with computer programs, right? So that was very interesting for me, but I was really far away from this. So I wanted to learn more about it. And the more I was looking for this, everything seemed to be happening in architectural visualization world, right? More realistic stuff. So I gave it a go. I, I tried a couple of uh, projects, interior, render, exterior, and very quickly I fell in love with architecture and interior design and visualizing. So, so far, like, like what, what everything happens gradually for me. I never really plan stuff, you know, just things happen. And I just take chances and I see what happens, uh, you know, Take risk. So no matter where you are, no matter what you do, it just doesn't matter. You know, you can just, even if you don't know really what you want to do, just start doing something and follow the things you're good at and follow the things that you enjoy doing. And that's, it, it's actually sounds simple and it is simple. It just requires uh, a lot of discipline and a lot of work, but I think it's worth it. So uh, this is the thing that I became obsessed about. This is not an error. I didn't place an image there for a reason because I trick people, some people, into believing that some of the stuff I did was real. But to, for me, it's like far, far away from the thing I want to do. So it's a struggle, but I guess that's a good thing because you know, if if, I, if you reach a certain goal, then you kind of, you know, it's about the journey, not about the destination thing. So uh, yeah, maybe someday there will be a picture in here, but maybe not. It doesn't matter. So I was really f like, I broke everything down into this photorealism thing. What does it take to make a realistic image or some, to a certain extent, realistic image, right? So I was, uh, I realized that usually most of the projects are like, you have the standard process of creating an image, but then it, this is the last piece, usually the last bit in the end, you have to tweak all the details all the little things that make a huge difference. And unfortunately, that graph turns around and it's 
the time, if you look at the time, the most time you spent is the last bit part, so like the last bit. So it takes a lot of time to tweak that last part to make it really stand out, to make a good looking image or a realistic image. And this is, uh, this is where you need, uh, I think you need a lot of practice and you need a lot of experience. I call this the eye training. For instance, one of these images is my very old project and the other one is one of my recent ones. I sincerely hope you can tell which is which. Um, yeah, so when I look at the old image, I can see so many things that I could do different, right? At the time when I was doing this, I just didn't see it. It's not necessarily that I didn't know how to do it, you know, didn't know which, use, uh, which tool to use, but it's just, you know, I don't know, it looks, it looks great, that's it, I'm just gonna publish this, this is perfect. You know, it's after all these years of, uh, looking at these things. So what I do is I, I look at the photographs, I look at magazines, and I try to really learn from them, right? Like, f focus on, not renders, photographs. And I go outside, explore nature, I, I explore the way light behaves, I explore the way materials react to light, all the details you see, and I really try to focus on them and think about those things all the time, like touching the surfaces and looking like there's a bunch of fingerprints here and you know, seeing how this actually looks. And doing that for all these years, you learn to see more than you did. So, so this is a very good practice. And uh, if you're after something like I am, I think it's, uh, it's worth it. So at one point I decided to, okay, I gotta find the most realistic renderer, right? So these are the couple of them that work with Cinema 4D. So I said, yeah, I'll find the most realistic renderer that gives you the most realistic result. And I'm going to work with that. So I made a little test. So I tried seven different renderers and I came with the exact same result. So I realized, okay, this is not about the renderers. This is something else. So I just decided to use the ones that I like the most and the ones that are most, the best implemented inside of Cinema 40. Um, the ones that I, you know, that fit the work that I do best. So, you know, as you see a lot of discussion online, which renderer is more realistic, which is not. So this is, um, don't listen to that, don't read that, it doesn't matter. You know, you can really do anything with everything. It's just a matter of personal preference, which, which one works better for you and for the kind of work you do. So I use CPU and GPU renderers. I have a bunch of graphics cards. And when I need a quick render, like it's a quick turnaround, quick deadline, or if I have a, like an animation, I would go with uh, GPU renders. So I got a really quick result. But if I have a really huge scene or a huge uh, environment uh, with a, a lot of models, so it takes a lot of RAM or VRAM, I just use uh, V-Ray or Corona. So, so there's CPU renders, so I don't have to worry about VRAM. Um, so I. I'm going to break things down a little technically at this time. So when I was, when I'm thinking about creating something that looks realistic, that looks nice, you know, it's, it's about modeling, texturing and lighting. So when I model things, I really try to focus on all the little details. Like again, here it helps that you explore and, and take pictures and have a lot of references because sometimes you think you know exactly what something looks, but in reality, uh, your mind has a, an idea of how things look, but when you take a picture and have references near, it's, you can see that you're wrong. So adding a lot of details, placing objects that are not symmetrical, nothing is symmetrical, adding like details like the edges, the, the beveled edges and stuff like that. So what I like to do is really practice by trying to replicate photographs. So one of those is uh, a photograph from Fantastic Frank. Uh, and I really liked it, so I decided to recreate it in, uh, in 3D. And the goal was not to really recre recreate it, like identically, but just try to figure out, you know, certain things, try to model exactly the way or s s uh, similarly to what this looks like, you know, some, some cloth, tablecloth and chairs and stuff like that. So uh, it's a nice practice, you know, just keep, uh, keep practicing. It's obvious which is which, right? So. I really go into all the details, like really all the details with modeling. And, you know, sometimes it's pointless to model everything. So, you know, I find, find a nice model online, like this plant here. 
I could model it. I could use plugins to model it. But, you know, I find a nice model. It's a couple of dollars. I'm just going to buy it. So it, it depends. If I'm practicing modeling, then I model everything. But if I'm just, you know, feeling like practicing lighting, practicing composition, I just buy models online and use them. And I use all kinds of modeling techniques. I also use uh, uh, sculpting a lot. I enjoy sculpting for this candle here, for instance. Um, I used to use ZBrush a lot. Um, but lately, in the, since Cinema 4D has sculpting tools, I don't even need ZBrush anymore because its uh, sculpting tools are very powerful for what I do. So now you have a, let's say you made a decent looking model, a really good looking model. So you start texturing. And this is also very, very important. So what I like to do is I like to use different channels like the fuse, specular, bump displacement, normal, and like a PBR workflow. Uh, this really helps with, uh, with materials and uh, realism. So I, I sometimes, often actually, I buy textures online. So it's, you know, there's, there's a couple of resources that are really good and you need something uh, for a client job really quickly. I just go in and look for the textures online and buy them. But sometimes you have something specific and you're just gonna have to, you know, figure things out. That's when I use, uh, my camera and take pictures of textures if they're available. For instance, clients has this special wood texture that needs to be used. So they send it to me or I go pick it up, take, pic take pictures of it in the correct uh, lighting environment and then edit those in Photoshop and create all those ch uh, channels I showed you before. Or I use Substance Designer to create everything from scratch. Yeah, sometimes you don't even have the reference material. Sometimes you have nothing, just a little little picture of how something looks. So they, uh, then I use up the designer. It's, uh, it's, for me, it's time consuming, but if, it's, if it has to be done, if it, there's not, a, not, not another way, I just do it, get in and mess around with substances. So the bottom line is, for me, it has to be high quality, no matter what you do. Are you take pictures, or you scan, uh, scan them, or you, uh, uh, buy them online. When you zoom in very closely, they still have to be sharp. They have to be really, really sharp. You can't use a low resolution texture. So I'm talking about 5K to 75K or 25 million K. I don't care. And it, it's important, you know, it has to be. Everything in real life is high quality. You don't see uh, low res textures like that. That doesn't exist. So even the, even the objects that are in the, in the background, right? far from the camera, that you think that what you, you don't want to see those details. Uh, I still like to have all high quality textures. Even if you have a shallow depth of field, I don't care. You know, I believe every pixel counts. So a little detail in the bokeh is maybe will do the trick of giving you a better result. So I never take chances and I just do everything high quality, no matter what. And I like to not, I like not to overcomplicate everything. So I like simple lighting, I like simple, uh, scenes and simple material, but sometimes you can get away with it. Sometimes you can't. For instance, you have uh, you have like a complex material, so you can't make it simple. Like many layers, one over the other, and it just doesn't. You, sometimes you just have to complicate things. For instance, here's an example: this door here, this wooden door here. So I, uh, the idea here was you have a new door and it's painted. And then it was scratched and it got dirty. And so you clean it up a little bit, paint another layer over it, right? And then it gets dirty again. So you do that like many times. So you have many, many layers of different dirt, different colors, different paint, and worn out edges, the chipped off paint, the dirt and everything. So that's when uh, things tend to get a little complicated uh, with the shaders, but the results are usually, usually much more believable because nothing is really perfect and clean. Even when you buy something, as soon as you, for instance, buy a laptop and you, let's, you place that cover away, it's perfect. But as soon as you touch it, that's it. It's never going to be perfect again. So that's mostly what we see in real life. And that's what we're used to seeing. So if you, if you make a render and everything is so sharp and clean, it just doesn't feel right. It can't be like this. It's impossible. Like this handle here also scratched up used, you can see fingerprints, and uh, believe it or not, 
I hate unwrapping. Everybody loves it, but I hate it. Uh, so what I like to use is um, box mapping, cubic ma mapping te techniques. I try to get away with whatever I can so I don't have to unwrap everything. So I just, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, tricks, trickery to get it done. Ambient occlusions, dirt maps. Just please don't, don't make me unwrap. But sometimes you have to. You know, there's like a specific detail. Like, for instance, this table here. I see this detail and I want it placed right here because it feels good with the composition. And you just, just unwrap it and paint it there. I use body paint and substance painter. It's uh, sometimes it's these things really when you have a close up and you have an idea of how things should look, then it's just the best way to paint everything by hand. Uh, it gives you the best result. So after all these details you do, sometimes you just, you can barely even notice them. You can see the, the, the detail I showed you before from the door. You can see a little bit of it, right? But every, again, every pixel here and there, the, adding those details, like every little detail on everything, on every model, thinking about every model will be in focus, even though it's not. In the end, it makes a huge difference. It's a lot of work, but it really, I think it, like, it pays, off, pay, uh, pays off. So uh, I've been uh, using uh, scan models lately because uh, actually it's much easier to work with them. I use uh, mega scans, and uh, when model is scanned, you will basically get the really high quality model with texture, and you basically you just grab and throw it inside your 3D project, uh, program, and you already have it. So a lot of things have been made more simple in the la last couple of years. So here I also used real displacement textures, and um, you know it just. The thing about this is they're really high quality, they're really awesome, but there's not like an like un unlimited amount of them. So for instance, you're doing a personal projects and you're like, I want you know, this uh, stone rock to look this way, but I can't find anything. So I'm just gonna use what I have, right? I'm gonna go and find, okay, that's a rock texture. I'm gonna throw it on the rock. It looks perfect, great. But when you have a client project, for instance, or if you're very specific like me, you know, you just can't find anything. So that's, when you, that's why I use still the techniques I didn't show you. Because you just have something in your mind, you don't want to do it, and you don't want to make any compromises by being limited to the textures and materials that are available. So architectures, a friend of mine, Christoph Schindler, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, kind enough to give me his stuff before he's selling them for me to test them. So he makes a scan, he says, hey man, wanna, wanna try this? So he sends it over. So I'm lucky enough to be playing around with this stuff. Uh, so here's, I'm gonna give you a little example of uh, how, I use, how I sometimes work. So this is a ground floor scanned. And I saw, he sent me this. Hey, I made this today, check it out. And I really liked it. So I said, I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do something for him. I'm gonna create a scene and uh, try to make it as, as, as good as I can. I'm gonna send, him, send it to him over so he has it for promotion. So, okay, so I said, let's create something. Um, I created this uh, ground and some water and HDR image here, and I'm, wrong, I'm really not sure what I'm doing here. So there's like, when I'm doing my personal work, sometimes I know exactly what I'm gonna do. Like instance, before, before I copy it, like a photograph, sometimes I have something in my mind, I want to create and also follow that, try to make it exactly like a, like, like a sketch maybe. But most of the time, I will just go and, you know, do things on the fly, see where my, uh, my brain takes me. So I just, you know, I'll start doing something, I'll see what happens. So this is, the, this is exactly what happened in this case. I, um, I'm not sure what I'm doing, so I'm trying to think of things. So I made this, uh, this ground water, so let's say, Let's say this was, uh, was a, there was a storm, okay? I'm trying to think of the story. There was a storm, uh, so there's a lot of trees here and the leaves and the wind blows and the wind blows the leaves in the water. Let's do something like that, okay? So I um, have this ground uh, texture. So when I add another layer of leaves, right? So real displacement leaves, um, I'm gonna use a couple of those. And the trick here is, 
This is not a simple plane and a texture applied to it, right? So you have a deformation in the leaf itself. It's just such a tiny detail in the overall scene, for instance, but those details, again, count. So it, the way light, light behaves on the surfaces, the way sh shadows fall on this, you, you get this depth feeling. So again, this, if you place this and scatter it on the floor, for instance, and then, or you place a simple plane with a texture, it's an enormous dis uh, difference. So I place these uh, leaves on the ground. I use octane for this and octane scatter. So, uh, okay, we got leaves on the ground. We expect some leaves on the water, right? So I throw some uh, leaves, scatter the leaves on the water. And, okay, so I'm trying to think of a story some more. Let's say the current and the wind blew the winds to the shore, uh, the leaves to the shore. So I modeled the this, this surface here where I would scatter the leaves. And you can see this, this shape happening here. So I'm, as, I'm just you know, imagining things on the, on the go. Obviously, the, the trees are missing here, but, you know, it doesn't matter. I, I can imagine the trees. So, okay, I'm, you know, I, I'm getting more and more excited about this, and this is a point when I really, you know, I don't even want to stop working. I just want to do this. I want to continue. I don't even want to go to sleep. Luckily, um, luckily, I have my family, so they dragged me out of my office, so... <laughs> Okay, so next I start adding the trees. This looks okay. We'll see what happens later. So I created the trees using a plugin called Forester, and I use the same scan trees on uh, uh, leaves on the trees. So you get the same uh, same uh, same materials everywhere. So it makes sense, right? Okay, um, not good, looking good. Let's do another um, more trees, different color. I want some more trees. Some of the more green trees. Still not good enough. Okay, so that looks that looks okay. So I'm I'm getting some nice reflections here in the water, which I really like. So actually, I'm seeing this this left part. I think it looks pretty good. I don't want to do anything there anymore, almost. So the the background and the right part of the image is empty. So I want to do something else. The background is empty. So I just grab everything that I have and just throw it, copy it, and paste it in the background. So we get this. So it kind of gets a feeling like there's a bunch of stuff going on, but in reality, it's just two planes, scattered trees, leaves, and planes in the water, nothing else. So it's, it's, a, it's a trickery again. When you look at this, it kind of, wow, this is like a complex scene or something, but you know, it's really not. So, okay, I'm liking this. The bottom right looks, um, doesn't look good enough. So what I think, maybe I should add, a, like the, feeling like it's a, the water is shallow. So what I do is, is model another surface, and I would place the texture on it. The same texture I use on the ground, the, the, the forest ground, right? And now you can see some of the parts are sticking out, some of them are inside. You know, you, see, you can see like the leaves drowned to the ground, and it gets the, like a, more of a depth effect. So breaking images into little parts, little pieces, right? And thinking about details, not, and then when you're making those details, you go back and look at the whole image, and then you see area where it doesn't look right, and then you focus on that little detail, and just keep going, you know? It, the, the, the thing is not to overdo it. So I still feel like I should add more stuff, so I find these dead tree models, also scanned, and place them around, like here in the water and there on the shore, and I think, okay, that's enough with the models. I don't feel the depth here. Like after the storm, you usually get this like a mist rising, low, low mist, low fog. So I model the surface that would represent the fog. So it's octane fog. Try this. And that's where I said, okay, this is enough. This is looking okay. I'm, I could do a lot of more stuff here, but I just don't want to. I'm just going to stop and start working on something else. Because this is something I, I, I did a long time ago. I would, I would start doing projects and I just never knew how to stop. Always wanna do more stuff, change things. You have uh, five versions and in the end, I don't even know which one is my favorite. So I ended up sometimes not even posting stuff. So I really had to force myself every time to publish something because I think it could be so much better. But you know, okay, I just gotta quit and start doing something else. 
So you can see little details like this fog make a pretty huge difference. You get more of the atmospheric feeling and uh, the depth. So in all in all, it's like super simple. Like you can literally do it in like a couple of hours. Uh, but it all comes down to the idea and the uh, basically the composition. To be honest, if I look, uh, I for I, this is one of the shots I was working on it for a while, and then I decided to look for something else. You can see everything is the same. You got the same uh, exactly the same scene, but it just doesn't work for me. It looks okay, but if you look at this image and this image, it's just, you know, it's a world difference. So it's always important to explore different scenes. This is an advantage of 3D scene. You can just, you know, if you're drawing this or painting this, you're stuck in this shot, you know. You, you can't change anything unless you start over. But in 3D, sometimes when I work, I just decide to, okay, so this is looking great, but I'm going to still move my camera around to see if I can find something better. And you start looking for, for positions, compositions, and stuff like that, and it makes a huge difference. So this part here uh, really doesn't really have to do that much with 3D. It more has like a, a photographic aspects. And this is when I, this is something that's super important for me. It doesn't matter how realistic your scene is, if it's just a table and a chair, you know, it's, and it looks super realistic, hyper real, like you can't tell if it's a photo or not. It's just a damn chair and a table, right? It's nothing. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make you feel anything. So it's, uh, for me, the photo uh, photography is very important. So I believe every CG artist should have advanced knowledge of cameras and lenses and uh, uh, artistic aspects as well. So compositions, colors, and harmony, everything. Because again, you can create everything really good, a really good scene, but you, if you don't know how to place the camera, how to um, really nice, find a nice composition, it just won't work. So the lighting here is very helpful. So you really know how, you have to know how to light the scene. So I believe that modeling and texturing give you a really realistic result and the lighting gives you the, the atmosphere, the mood that you're looking for, right? And the, uh, I also believe that lighting also adds to the detailing. So what I do is I never, almost never use like a, in 3D sky and 3D sun, I always like to use HDR images because they give you this little detail of lighting. Like you have uh, this, for instance, uh, sun and there's, a, there's clouds and these clouds are adding to the quality of the light. So like the light is coming through the window inside. It's different when you have a sun or you have a HDR that is blocked a little bit by this uh, little, little cloud. Again, little details, but important. So when I use lights, I use photometric data, IES. So you can see the difference here. Usually that's, the, that's a very subtle, subtle detail as well. But you know, everywhere you can add more stuff a more realistic aspect that helps as well. Um, also, when I use simple area lights, I place pictures or images of uh, like softbox here, like like you have a uh, studio set up lights. And again, this softbox, you may think this won't affect the lighting at all, but it does. It gives you a little bit of different reflection. It gives you different, a little bit of different lighting and it breaks the shadows down slightly. You don't have the perfect shadow. You have a little deformations in the shadow. Okay, so uh, this, this sounds like it's a lot of, you know, thinking about different stuff, de details and everything. But when you dig deep into this stuff, it's everything is really just normal and you just get used to it and you don't really think about it. You just do it because you're, you know you have to do it, so and it really doesn't take that much time, because once you have all the all the all these techniques figured out, and once you have most of the most of the images and HDRs, and uh, it's much a quicker process. But it's always a good idea to think about all these things, because um, they really count. So you, if you if you use all this all these things that I'm showing you. And if you use just a simple setups with nothing, uh, with, with just with not, no, none of those details, it's amazing what the difference is. 
So this is uh, more of a technical about lighting, but what I like lighting in 3D is, uh, is creating a mood, an atmosphere. So this is one project I did with Sanya Zvonkovic. She's uh, an amazing architect. She came up with this house design, and I did the renders. And the, um, so we, we said, like, you know, it's, it's, when I talk about personal project, it can, people tend to think it's, uh, you know, you do projects for yourself. But it's actually a pretty good idea to do a project and uh, do a project with other, other artists or, you know, sound designers or architects or whatever. It doesn't matter. Everybody learns from the experience. Okay? So I did a couple of those uh, renders. So one of them is uh, this sunny, sunny atmosphere. So I like, like to uh, look for lighting and see how everything behaves, how materials behave to the, uh, to the scene. So this is a night scene. So really part that I enjoy, early morning scene. And uh, so little, this little misty background stuff. So it's the most fun process for me, and I really enjoy it. But you have to have the materials and the models ready to go. In this case, I decided to animate this. And while I was, at, while I was looking at this, everything seemed so still, almost dead. So I said, OK, this is, this, something is missing. We're used to seeing the leaves move. Everything seems to be in motion, right? So I started using some plugins. Uh, so I used the Forester plugin because it's, uh, it's very simple to use. A couple of quicks, uh, clicks, like you could get uh, uh, animation of the tree. You can get a simulation of the leaves with a couple of clicks. If you don't want to create everything from scratch, you can use a library. Um, there's so many models out there. So let me show you the difference. So this is one of the more older projects. And this is a shot, an animation with still leaves. Okay, and this is with the animated leaves. So you can see the, the movement of the leaves is very subtle. There's not much going on, but the difference is quite huge because we're used to seeing this. We're used to seeing the, uh, the motion everywhere. I also use this in interiors as well. So these two uh, plants are inside, this tree is outside, so I just simulated um, the same plugin. And in the interiors, um, we have um, the cloth, tablecloth, and the curtain simulation as well. I use X Particles plugin for this. So this is the end result. So it's here, I exaggerate a little bit. Uh, but you know, it's interesting for me to to see how you know how it how it comes out. So you know, it's different. It just we're used to seeing this, and something I'm trying to implement. It takes a lot of time and effort, but I'm slowly getting a grip of those simulation stuff. So again, it's trying to learn new stuff, trying to learn new tools. Um, here's another example. I uh, decided to do this uh, super simple scene. So I, I said, I'm going to challenge myself again. I'm going to create a super simple scene, like a couple of models, and I'm going to create a 30-second animation. Um, so I found this nice model on TurboSquid. I decided not to model it because this one was pretty much perfect. So this is what I made. A cube, windows, sofa, table, and nothing much else. So very, very simple. So I said, OK placed a couple of things. Now, try to make an animation out of this that looks somewhat interesting. Uh, and it was quite a challenge. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is, what I, this is what I came up with.
Oh, thank you. So it's always about not doing repetitive stuff, not doing the same things over and over. It's about trying new stuff, trying to figure new stuff out. And I like this trickery that you just sh I was showing you. I do this quite often. You know, you have a scene, you think it's a whole environment and everything, but in reality, look what I did here. A couple of planes and nothing else. You know, I, I sometimes do this kind of stuff to see if I can get away with it. And the big benefit here is that um, there's not many bounces, light bounces required to, to illuminate the scene. So it's, uh, um, it renders much quicker, but sometimes you can't get away with it. Sometimes, you know, you just have to have the full environment. I do that also, but usually the processing is much uh, more complex. So rendering is much slower. And the, um, you know, you got 360 images, many different angles. So, so I like to explore different, diff different stuff. So this brings me to, it takes a lot of work. This is a pretty good book from Malcolm Gladwell. It's called, it called Outliers. And he says you need 10,000 hours to be good at anything. Like if you're an athlete, musician, whatever you are, you need at least 10,000 hours to be at least, you know, to some extent good. And I really believe that. I mean, you can get away with, like you can buy a model, couple of models and place a light and something, you get a nice image, you know. But to be really able to be function in, in the production, you really have to have experience, to be ready for all kinds of scenes. Again, this uh, personal projects help you a lot because you challenge yourself all the time and you're used to challenges and then the clients come so with, with, your, with a challenge, you're ready, you know, you can do all kinds of stuff already. But if you focus only on certain areas and you're really good at those and then uh, you get a client job and then you're in trouble because you don't really know how to do this. And so it takes a lot of work, yes, and I always tell everybody to reach out to the other artists because to me, I, I, I have a lot of artist friends and really help me a lot along my way. And what I try to do is always try to get back to them, I try to um, give back to the community. So I record tutorials on Patreon. I teach occasionally in schools and universities. I do workshops and pr presentations and try to get people excited about 3D, try to quickly tell them my story as well, because people think, okay, I can't do this. I live here, I live there, I'm that, I'm this. It doesn't matter. If you work hard, you know, if you're, if you're focused, uh, it can work out. And this is the part that's very important as well, the focused work. So you can work like 20 hours a day, but if you're uh, browsing on the net and doing some random stuff in between, you know, you won't be that productive. So I have, uh, I have this thing that when I work, I work hard. And when I relax, then I relax. I like to spend time with my family. I have my uh, wife, Jelka, two daughters, Ela and Mia. I love spending time with them. And you know, it's like, if I'm gonna mess around with this thing too much, this, I'm, it's gonna cut my time with my family, right? So I really focus and I really work hard. And when I'm done, I just get out and spend time with my family. My friends, we go play music, you know, whatever. So very important also, I have almost burned out many times because trying, trying too hard. So you have to find this uh, time for work, time for focused work and time for relaxing and get enough sleep and everything because um, burning out is not a fun thing. So um, that's pretty much it, um, I'm out of time. Um, you can reach out to me on social media. Um, I'll be around here all day. Uh, if you have any questions, ne trebamo engleski pričamo, tako da um, reach out to me. Uh, you know, I don't know if I have time for questions or anything, but uh, thank you so much for coming here. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you.